Good day, folks. I'm just letting people trickle into the Zoom uh, for another minute or so, and then we'll get going. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Matthew Herter. I'm the director of the Health Justice Institute at Dalhousie University, um, which is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we are all treaty people. Um, it's my pleasure to be hosting you on Zoom today uh, with, we have an exciting speaker, uh, Professor Chris Morton, who's joining us from New York and Columbia University's Law School. I'll uh, introduce uh, Chris in a moment. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping points uh, for the, the seminar. Um, um, if you have questions uh, that come to mind uh, that you'd like to raise in the discussion that will follow uh, Chris's presentation, um, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I'll be sort of moderating the discussion and reading those questions uh, as much as people should be able to see them on the chat. Um, uh, so please feel free to engage during the talk, although we'll save the questions until the end. Um, uh, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Chris Morton um, as our seminar speaker for this uh, to start uh, this semester. We're about halfway through our seminar series for the academic year. Um, professor Morton is an associate clinical professor of law at Columbia Law School in New York City, and he's the founding director of Columbia's Sheik or Science, Health, and Information Clinic. He holds degrees in law and chemistry. His work as a clinical professor, um, uh, in that work, uh, Chris seeks to serve the public interest by seeking more equitable access to scientific, technical, and medical knowledge. His scholarship grows out of his clinical work and considers how law and policy shape the ways that knowledge flows through our economy, our society more broadly, and how law and policy influence how new technologies are invented, validated, manufactured, distributed, and used. Some of his recent publications describe the US Food and Drug Administration's legal authority to publicize a trove of valuable scientific data that it currently keeps secret or has kept secret. Other work analyzes the US government's power to use privately patented technologies in the service of the public interest. And he presents a progressive vision for the pharmaceutical and biotech sectors of our economy and society post COVID-19. Chris, in my view, is, is someone who doesn't just criticize uh, powerful corporate actors like Big Pharma. He articulates a positive vision. Uh, and that's something that is, 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 is really um, needed in this conversation about how do we re remake the world of pharmaceutical knowledge production, technology, and so on. Uh, Professor Morton joined Columbia Law Faculty in 2021. Before that, he was the Deputy Director of the Technology Law and Policy Clinic at New York University School of Law, <clears throat> a fellow at NYU's en Engelberg Center on Innovation Law and Policy, a supervising attorney and clinical lecturer in Yale Law School's Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic, also known as the Mafia Clinic. How do you come up with such good clinic names? <laughs> Uh, and the staff attorney at Yale's Collaboration for Research, Integrity, and Transparency, or CRIT. Maybe that's, that's the weakest of the bunch, I'm sorry. <laughs> he remains a visiting fellow of Yale's Global Health Justice Partnership and affiliate fellow of Yale's Information Society Project. Uh, before beginning his teaching career, uh, Professor Morton worked as a litigation associate and patent agent at American law firms. Uh, we're so pleased to have you join us, uh, Chris. Uh, over to you for a presentation that I'm really excited to hear. Um, thank you all so much, Matt, um, for that very generous introduction. Can, can you all hear me okay? Am I coming through? Okay. Um, thank you all for, for having me. I'm, I'm truly sorry that I'm not there um, in Halifax in person. Um, I very dearly want to visit uh, uh, Dow, visit Halifax. Um, some family medical problems and a 
nasty chest cold um, of my own have kept me in New York City. Um, please excuse me, by the way, if you hear me cough or I need to take a break uh, for a sip of water. Uh, and I apologize for looking like, like death warmed over. Um, once again, just thanks so much for including me in this amazing um, event series. I've watched a number of the, the, the recordings um, of these past lectures, and so it's really an honor for me to be um, among your presenters. Um, so thanks to Matt, thanks to Sheila, thanks to Ashley and everyone involved in making this event happen. Um, okay, I'm going to try to share some slides. Um, and as Matt knows, I'm going to try to do something a little bit flashy, which I hope will work. Um, I'm going to try to make my slide deck, my virtual background. So I hope you all see me um, kind of talking over my slides. Um, if that's not the case, then uh, someone please unmute and give me a shout. Um, so I'm here today to talk about my and my student clinics uh, partnership with T1 International on public pharma initiatives in the United States. Uh, I'm gonna say much more about what T1 International is, what public pharma is and what my clinic is. Um, I'll start just by saying this is a legal practice project that's been underway for just over a year now. Um, and I have not um, written a paper on this uh, or given a formal talk on this before. So you all are um, in one sense, uh, I guess, unlucky guinea pigs getting an untested talk, um, but you're also getting a first look at, at hot off the presses work um, that my students and I have done. Um, okay, so, uh, Here's a roadmap to how I propose to use my talk. I'm gonna start with a very brief background on myself, then explain what my legal clinic is and does. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about who we represent in the abstract, um, and then I'm gonna focus on one beloved client, um, T1 International, which is a diabetes patient group. And then I'll get to the heart of the talk, uh, which is public pharma. And uh, I'll first introduce what I mean by the phrase public pharma or a public option in pharma and biotech. Um, and then I'll give you the longer version. I'll look backward and explain how T1 International's public insulin project arose. Um, and then I'll talk about what my students and I have done with the insulin for all activists at T1I. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I think the future holds um, for public insulin, public pharma more broadly in the United States. And I'm gonna close with a, a short bit of meta reflection on what this work means to me and why I think it's among uh, the most important stuff that I do. Uh, and I will acknowledge uh, some of the folks at T1 International and my students uh, and various allies who make this work possible. Um, and then I'm eager to take your questions. Um, so very briefly about me, uh, as Matt said, I, I trained as a chemist. I kind of burned out of academic chemistry. Um, I got recruited. Uh, my sort of highest and best use according to the market was to work at a law firm um, as a patent agent and advisor on patent cases, fighting over you know, ownership and, and, um, and profits. Uh, uh, from um, uh, you know, block, blockbuster um, pharmaceuticals and other medical products. Um, that got me interested in law and in, especially in the areas of law, including patents that structure the creation and dissemination of new uh, technologies. Um, I went to law school, I practiced patent law for a few years and then became um, a law teacher in 2018. Um, the lawyers in the audience will know what a law clinic is. Um, Dell has some amazing ones, um, but non-lawyers may not. So I thought I'd explain briefly what a law clinic is. Effectively, Columbia pays me to teach the practice of law to my students. Um, I teach skills, I teach problem solving, strategic, uh, strategic thinking, and so on, um, rather than teaching a set body of doctrine like contract law. Um, I represent clients pro bono. Um, I am their lawyer and I bring them into Columbia Law School, um, into the legal services organization that lives within Columbia Law School. And my students then represent those clients with me. Um, this is experiential learning. This is students actually going to court, going to Congress, going to agencies and learning from the real world of legal work. I also do a bit of more traditional law professor stuff. I write articles sometimes, um, but most of my job is, is practicing law and teaching students to practice law with me through the clinic. So a word on the clinic, um, it's called the Science, Health and Information Clinic um, or SHIC or CHIC. We can't seem to decide um, uh, how to pronounce the acronym. I usually say SHIC like the razor. Um, as Matt said, it's a new-ish clinic founded in 2021. Um, the name Science Health and Information Clinic is a bit of word salad perhaps, but I consciously wanted to avoid naming the clinic around any specific doctrine of law. So we're not specifically an intellectual property clinic or an administrative law clinic or a privacy law clinic. We work on all those areas, but I like to think that we enter into 
each client relationship and each project with an open mind about the, the right legal tools, the right areas of law, the right sort of rights and remedies to invoke to try to solve our clients' problems. Um, Schick is part of a pro bono legal services organization called Morningside Heights Legal Services that's housed within Columbia Law School, but is technically independent. Um, it's a legal services organization that provides pre, free legal help to indigent clients, clients that can't afford lawyers on their own. Currently, my clinic's clients are all nonprofit organizations. Um, they are mostly patient activist and consumer advocacy groups. Um, I strive to work with uh, groups that are not just formally nonprofit, but that are fully independent of industry funding. Um, I won't get into depth about clients other than um, T1 International, but I'll just briefly mention three of my clinic's longtime clients. One is Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, UAEM, uh, which is an international student organization um, committed to promoting health equity and access to medicines around the world. Doctors for America, which is an independent and progressive medical organization um, focused not on doctors bottom lines, but on patient care, uh, public health and health equity. Uh, and Prep for All, uh, an independent HIV, HIV AIDS patient advocacy org. Um, in Q and A, if folks have questions about um, specific work I've done with these clients, I'm glad to, uh, to talk more. But I wanna turn to um, T1 International and tell you a bit about um, who they are. So T1 International, as the name suggests, is an international organization. It's a not-for-profit um, that advocates for people living with diabetes. In T1I's own words, um, T1 International is a global type 1 diabetes advocacy organization led by people with type 1 diabetes for people with type 1 diabetes. T1 International believes in a world where everyone with type 1, no matter where they live, has everything they need to survive and achieve their dreams. And in 2024, T1 International was part of uh, the launch of the Insulin for All campaign, um, which has grown into a global movement. T1I is a health justice organization, but it's also an intersectional social justice organization. It's committed to racial justice, to gender justice, uh, and to meeting the needs of patients around the world, not just in the US and other um, global North countries. Currently, T1 International has, uh, I think it's 41 or 42 chapters um, in various US states. Um, and it has chapters or, or um, uh, uh, partners and advocates in more than 20 countries around the world. Uh, T1 International also prides itself um, uh, on not accepting any money from the pharmaceutical or medical device industries. Um, Incidentally, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I know little about T1I's presence in Canada. Um, I know that they have volunteers and campaigns here, um, but uh, unfortunately can't share much more than that. As a US lawyer, I've really worked with um, uh, their US chapters. Um, so I mentioned that they're independent. Um, another thing that attracted me to T1 International and makes me proud to represent them um, is that they are, uh, or they aspire at least to be a true patient-led, member-led organization. Um, as I said, they have dozens of chapters across the US and some of those chapters have um, hundreds of volunteers. And the chapters and various working groups that work on specific issue areas uh, become the engines of the organization. Chapters and working groups vote on priorities and then T1I's leadership, their staff, implements those priorities. Um, it's not the other way around. Um, on screen here are three of the current priorities voted on by T1I's US Federal Working Group. Um, those are a federal price cap on insulin, new legislation for that, an end to tax breaks for big pharma, uh, and patent reform. Um, T1 International also has a, a state level working group. Um, they currently have four priorities voted on um, by their chapters, by their members. One is Alex Law, which creates an insulin safety net for people at risk of having a ration um, or go without insulin. Kevin's Law, which allows pharmacists to dispense insulin if a patient is in crisis and can't reach a prescriber. Public insulin production and procurement, um, which will be the focus of my talk. And formulary reform and non-medical mid-year plan switching to try to prevent patients from experiencing um, stressful and dangerous changes to their insulin options. Um, so uh, I, I've already said this and I, I, I guess I don't wanna belabor this, but um, I will stress that T1I um, has declined any funding from um, pharma and medical device companies. Um, they're transparent about their funding and you can check their website. Um, they currently rely on a mix of philanthropies and small dollar donors. Um, I personally give every month. Um, 
patient groups, as many of you know, um, even nonprofit patient groups and patient groups that do in many cases really important work um, are often not independent of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there's a report that Public Citizen put out last uh, month um, that I think is really eye-opening, um, shows that, that there are some patient groups that um, derive the majority of their funding from pharma and biotech companies and um, not, not surprisingly end up adopting positions preferred by those companies. Um, the American Diabetes Association, a much larger organization than T1I, for example, received at least $11 million in grants from Sanofi and at least $7 million from Eli Lilly um, between 2010 and 2022. Um, Sanofi and Eli Lilly, of course, two of the big three insulin manufacturers. Um, so T1I is different in that regard. Um, and because T1I is independent, it can be, um, I think, uh, critical and adversarial um, and even confrontational. And when I first heard about T1 International, it was, I think, in 2018 or so, um, through Greg Gonsalves, a professor at Yale, where I was working at the time. Um, Greg is a veteran of ACT UP, um, the HIV AIDS and, and LGBTQ and, and the health justice uh, organization that's legendary um, in New York, at least. Uh, and Greg called T1I the ACT UP of diabetes. Um, the comparison is inexact, but I think T1I does capture some of ACT UP's um, ethos and energy. Um, here, for example, is a picture um, and news coverage of one of T1I's actions, a stop the greed protest at Eli Lilly's headquarters in Indianapolis, calling for price cuts on Lilly's insulin products. Um, okay, so back to the robot. That was uh, an introduction to me and my clinic and my client, T1 International. So let me now get to the main event, which is public pharma. Uh, what do we mean by that phrase? Um, I'm gonna start with an introduction of just a few minutes. Um, in short, I think it's fair to say that by public pharma, we mean a public option in pharmaceuticals. More precisely, we mean state actors or government actors. Um, in the US, that can be local, it can be state, it can be federal government actors taking over some or all of the functions that private companies currently play in the ecosystem of pharma. Um, that can mean government agencies manufacturing drugs, it can mean government agencies researching, developing drugs. It can mean government agencies distributing drugs to patients. It can mean government agencies negotiating the prices of drugs and establishing formularies for different insurers um, and more. Um, T1 International and I sometimes talk about all of this, public manufacturing, public distribution, and so on, um, as a public option, uh, because public agencies don't necessarily have to completely displace the private companies that we currently rely on to get medicines to patients, um, or largely rely on. Uh, in a second, I'll show you that there's actually public pharma already existing in the US, um, so some patients are already benefiting from public pharma agencies. Um, in our view, uh, public pharma can complement and compete with private pharma without completely displacing it. Dana Brown at the Democracy Collaborative um, is probably the leading historian and theorist and, and exponent of public pharma in the United States. Um, this is one of her uh, many excellent papers on uh, public pharma, um, uh, her Medicine for All paper from 2019. And she uses this framing a lot, a public option. Um, this, this uh, document, again, I, I, uh, I'm going to share at the end of my talk some uh, kind of further reading for folks who are interested, but this place is a great, this, this, uh, this piece from Dana is a great place to start. Um, okay, so uh, to get more exact, public pharma can and does mean a lot of different things. As Dana Brown and others have shown, um, there are a lot of different points in the life cycle, in the network, in the ecosystem of pharmaceuticals where public agencies could get involved. Um, and in fact, they already are involved in lots of uh, these places. Um, public laboratories can and do basic science uh, and drug discovery, of course. In the US and Canada, public labs do lots and lots and lots of this. Disproportionate shares of the most important breakthrough medical products emerge from government labs. Um, and public agencies like the US um, National Institutes of Health can and do fund, design, and conduct clinical trials. Um, the US NIH actually runs and uh, uh, funds more trials than any other entity on earth. Um, I think there's a kind of conventional wisdom, at least in the US, that public laboratories are pretty good uh, or even very good at early stage development, but don't have the right knowledge um, or incentives or internal structures to do late stage development, um, including phase three trials and other work that, um, uh, that is needed to get regulatory approval. Um, but that's not true either. Um, there are examples of the contrary. And one 
terrific counterexample comes from um, Matt, actually, and, and Janice Graham and Richard Gold, um, who published this paper on Merck's, I put that in quote, uh, Ebola vaccine, um, which showed that actually all, or essentially all of the relevant development work, including manufacturing of hundreds of doses uh, and completion of the key uh, uh, clinical trials, was done not by Merck, but by the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, um, which is part of the Public Health Agency of Canada, of course. Um, so uh, to go back to this kind of taxonomy of all the places public agencies can get involved, um, I think public agencies can and do uh, and have done um, everything that private pharma companies, private wholesalers, private pharmacies do. Um, public agencies can get products through regulatory approval. They can manufacture API and final formulated products. They can get products to warehouses, to clinics, to pharmacies, um, and to patients' front doors. Um, public agencies can even do their own kinds of marketing, um, what we might, I think, better term patient education or public education or patient outreach. Um, think here in the US, at least, of uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which informs the American public about products like COVID vaccines and encourages people to get them. Um, and part of what I'll um, share in a few minutes about uh, the work that I've done with T1 International um, is just this, trying to support a public insulin initiative and think about how to use both government resources and uh, patient group, activist group resources um, to inform patients about um, public insulin options that are on the horizon now. Um, so uh, one remarkable thing that Dana Brown and other scholars of public pharma have shown is that even in the US, that supposed bastion of um, free market capitalism, there are a number of public pharma enterprises already up and running. Um, some of these are decades old. Um, we have, for example, the CalRx Public Drug uh, Manufacturing Initiative in California, uh, which has been funded with tens of millions of dollars, which has announced an intent to begin manufacturing and distributing not just insulin, which I'll focus on um, in the remainder of my talk, but also naloxone. And they're promising drugs getting to patients in um, the next few years. Um, but we have other extant public manufacturing initiatives like Mass Biologics, which is a division of um, the University of Massachusetts Medical School established over a century ago. Um, Mass Biologics continues to make vaccines and other biologic products um, and distribute them throughout the US. Um, in Canada, of course, you have the famous lauded um, Connaught Labs in, in Toronto, um, the original insulin manufacturer, which manufactured and distributed insulin on a nonprofit basis for many years. Um, and we have public labs in the US um, doing procurement as well, using the bargaining power of large purchases, of bulk purchases to drive prices down for patients and then distributing the drugs that they procure to clinics, to pharmacies, um, or directly to patients. The Minnesota Multi-State Contracting Alliance for Pharmacy, um, aka MCAP, uh, MMCAP Infused, a public group purchasing organization and is one existing example in the US. Uh, it procures and distributes drugs to public healthcare facilities, uh, such as state agencies, counties, cities, and school districts. Um, the US federal government's Operation Warp Speed is arguably the most ambitious public procurement effort undertaken here in the US in generations. Um, the US Department of Health and Human Services spent many billions negotiating bulk purchases of vaccines and therapeutics um, and distributing them, typically through state governments, uh, to clinics and pharmacies around the country. Uh, and we have a major public pharmacy benefit manager as well here in the US now, um, a, a public PBM. Um, PBMs, as, as many of you um, probably already know, intermediate between insurance providers and pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, although PBMs, uh, private PBMs are increasingly owned by and integrated with those same insurance providers. Uh, PBMs create insurance formularies and pharmacy networks. They negotiate rebates with manufacturers. They review drug utilization, they process claims. And public agencies can do this work too. ArrayRx is a public PBM that seeks to displace for-profit PBMs. Uh, it started in Washington and Oregon and has now expanded to Nevada and Connecticut too. Um, it uses the pooled buying power of publicly insured people in those four member states to negotiate lower drug prices and pass savings on to patients. Um, I've learned that ArrayRx is a very lean operation. It's just a few people. Uh, it doesn't distribute any drugs. It just negotiates lower prices on them. Um, and yet it claims to have saved residents hundreds of millions of dollars um, in its lifetime. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna briefly mention uh, one more kind of general point on public pharma, uh, which is there's this book from Thomas Hanna, Our Commonwealth, The Return of Public Ownership in the United States. Uh, Thomas is a colleague or former colleague of Dana's. They worked together at the Democracy Collaborative. 
and he published this book in 2018. I mean, it makes the case that public enterprise, not just in pharma, but across many sectors of our society and economy, uh, have a long and proud tradition in the US. Um, and it's a terrific place to start if you want to learn more of that history. Um, <laughs> excuse me just a second while I cough and I will come right back on screen. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so this gives me an opportunity to talk uh, a bit more at a high level about why we might want public pharma over private. Um, I think I've gestured a bit at this. Um, uh, and in a second, I'm gonna get specific about why T1 International thinks that public agencies can do a better job of manufacturing and distributing insulin than for-profit companies can. Uh, but let me give you some high level arguments First, um, Dana lays these out really beautifully in the piece um, uh, on screen. Um, first and foremost, probably is cost savings. It's a truth almost universally acknowledged um, that healthcare is broken in the US um, and that part of that is that prescription drug prices, at least brand name drug prices are too high. Um, I'm not gonna get into the why and how, I'm glad to talk more in Q and A. Um, but um, I think high prices in the US are the number one driver of interest in public pharma. Um, Medicines are usually cheap to make once developed. Um, brand name drugs are often sold at a massive multiple, um, 50 or 100 times their manufacturing costs. Um, public drug manufacturers can and do make and sell some of the same medicines at much lower prices. They can sell them at cost or they can even give them away for free. And lower prices have all kinds of beneficial uh, spillover effects. Poor, un and underinsured people who suffer um, most from high drug prices uh, get better access to these products. Um, public insurers and public health agencies can allocate, could reallocate spending that, that currently goes to um, big for-profit drug companies, uh, to other kinds of healthcare, um, and so on. I'm glad to talk more about the cost saving point, but I'll, I'll pivot to another that I think is critical and a little bit less widely known, which is control of the R&D agenda. So the for-profit pharmaceutical company has for many decades neglected uh, some of the most pressing areas of research from a public health perspective. Um, things like tropical diseases, antibiotics, vaccines, and more. Um, we pay higher and higher prices for products that's, that often provide uh, little therapeutic benefit to individual patients and little benefit to overall public health. R&D-oriented public pharma labs can focus on the research likeliest to produce real breakthroughs. Um, and public development and manufacturing capacity can take promising discoveries already emerging from public labs like NIH and create alternative pathways to get them to patients. Public pharma can also mean resilience against drug shortages. So the US FDA reported a record number of generic drugs in shortage last year. Um, hospitals report rationing cancer and other drugs. Generic drug companies say the profit margins on many of these drugs are too low to keep them interested in manufacturing them. A public laboratory, a public manufacturer um, could make essential generic medicines and help ensure a steadier supply. Uh, and in the US, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Jan Schakowsky have proposed a bill that would do exactly this. Um, and there are more potential benefits that, that Dana and others have outlined. Things like data sharing and open science, um, a not-for-profit public lab could commit itself to doing the highest quality science and then providing broad and prompt and equitable access to that science. Um, it's an industrial policy move. Public pharma labs and manufacturing plants could provide stable, high paying jobs. Um, I think especially appealing in an industry that's grown um, increasingly financialized, um, where jobs are, uh, um, uh, where workers are experiencing um, stagnant salaries. Um, and the mere prospect or threat of viable public pharma options um, in manufacturing and procurement and PBM and elsewhere may chill some of the most egregious behavior from private pharma companies. Um, from PBMs uh, and other for-profit entities. In other words, we may not need to realize public pharma completely to begin seeing some of its benefits. Um, I think the pharma system in the US is so profoundly broken that there's a lot of room for improvement and experimentation. Public pharma doesn't have to be perfect or perfectly efficient to outcompete um, some of the private companies currently preying on American patients. Okay, so um, that was an overview, I hope helpful. Um, now I wanna get to my specific work with T1 International. And let me start with some history. How did this project arise? Um, I mentioned that I'm a patent lawyer and the very first work that I did with T1 International um, 
was uh, patent reform work. We developed comments on proposed USPTO and FDA rulemaking um, and policies, um, urging some reforms of patent examination. Um, and I'm glad to talk about that work. Um, but as we were doing that work together, um, California's public insulin initiative was really taking off in late 2022 or so. Um, so uh, California enacted a statute in 2020 that committed the state to direct some money and resources to make and distribute, um, or make or distribute, I should say, low cost insulin and perhaps some other drugs. Um, T1 International's California chapter was involved um, in the enactment of the law, by the way, to my knowledge. Um, and in fact, uh, in 2020, before the California law uh, was enacted, T1 International had published a white paper with Public Citizen advocating for a range of state legislative solutions to the problem of high insulin prices in the US, um, including public manufacturing of insulin. Um, but it was in 2022 that Calorex insulin really sort of took off, um, hit the headlines. That was the year that California confirmed that it would commit itself not just to procuring low cost insulin, uh, but actually making it. And it promised an ambitious timetable. It promised insulin in patients' hands as early as 2024. Uh, California's governor, Gavin Newsom, gave a splashy press conference where he said, nothing epitomizes market failures more than the cost of insulin, and that California is now taking matters into our own hands. Um, as of 2022, the big three insulin manufacturers were charging over $300 per vial of insulin um, to patients without insurance. Uh, and many patients, especially those with type 1 diabetes, need multiple vials per month um, of multiple insulin products to live. Uh, a recent national survey, um, I think in 2022, actually found that about 17% of all people living with diabetes ration their insulin. Q International's own surveys suggest that it might be even higher, like a quarter. CalRx promises to charge just $30 a vial, um, much lower price, a price at which many fewer people should have to go without. $30 vials of insulin could transform the lives of many people in California uh, and put pressure on the big three manufacturers to lower their prices in other states too. So T1I and I thought this is an opportune moment to try to shape the CalRx initiative and make sure it serves patients, um, especially on and underinsured patients, patients in rural areas and other disinvested areas, uh, and so on. Um, we thought T1I could marshal its um, energy, its volunteers, its voice to make CalRx a success. Um, I hadn't done much on public pharma. I was a patent lawyer after all. Um, I had written a short piece in 2020 with Dana Brown and Alex Lawson and Fran Quigley, urging for um, public vaccine R&D in manufacturing and distribution. Um, but I had a lot to learn about um, insulin and the unique challenges. Uh, but just kind of personally and selfishly, the more I learned and thought about CalRx insulin, um, the more excited I was to be personally involved, um, not just on, uh, and, and, and to make CalRx insulin a success, not just on California's terms, but on T1 International's uh, success for all people living with diabetes in California. Um, I think Gavin Newsom's splashy press conferences and the news coverage in 2022 and 2023 has made CalRx, for better or for worse, the poster child for public pharma in the US. So if CalRx succeeds, public pharma will have its biggest and boldest proof of concept yet. Um, if CalRx fails, as um, uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial board hopes, uh, for-profit drug companies and their boosters will use its failure to argue that public pharma was misguided um, <laughs> from the start. Um, okay, excuse me, I'm gonna take a quick uh, drink break and come right back again, I'm so sorry for this. Okay, sorry about that. This cold is truly kicking my butt. Um, uh, so, um, so let me tell you now, finally, uh, what T1 International, my students and I um, have done and are continuing to do vis-a-vis CalRx. Um, I wanna highlight six things um, that we've worked on. Six things to help CalRx succeed and we hope succeed in ways that really um, uh, meet the needs of the patients who need 
uh, lower cost insulin most. And I'm trying to move my head out of the way so that you can actually see the six. Um, the six things are making insulins plural, making products that patients need most, ensuring transparency and a voice for patients, um, ensuring that those vo patient voices are independent, um, analyzing Calyrex's contracts and advocating strong um, contract rights, uh, analyzing and solving distribution challenges, and building a market for Calyrex insulin. Um, so let me start with making insulins plural. Those in the audience who live with diabetes or have loved ones who do, um, you already know, um, but I confess I did not know before I started working with T1I. Pharmaceutical insulin is not a single thing. Um, different kinds of pharmaceutical insulin have very different pharmacodynamics, different effects on the body. Some insulins are rapid acting um, or short acting, some are intermediate, some are long acting. Many patients require more than one kind of insulin to keep their um, blood glucose levels and their health um, stable. So an early advocacy goal of T1Is was to convince CalRx to make um, not just one insulin product, but multiple. It wouldn't be enough for patients to just get one kind of insulin at $30 a vial. This turned out to be an early advocacy win for T1I and other patient groups in California. Um, Calorex is now committed to making and distributing three kinds of insulin, Lispro, Aspart, and Glargine. Um, those are rapid acting, rapid acting, and a long acting, respectively. Um, and ultimately, I think it's fair to say that T1I would like to see Calorex and other manufacturers provide even more types of insulin um, to patients. Um, okay, so a second thing T1I and I have worked on is ensuring transparency and a voice for patients in the CalRx initiative. Um, to explain that, I need to give you a little bit more background. CalRx is a California state-owned pharmaceutical brand. It's owned and managed by the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, HCAI. Uh, but HCAI doesn't actually have a factory to make insulin. It doesn't have a cadre of scientists or engineers. Um, it has no track record of pharmaceutical development or manufacturing. Um, and it actually has a uh, surprisingly small number of people overseeing the CalRx initiative. What California really has is law on the books committing this state agency, HCAI, to build a factory and to become an insulin manufacturer. But no state-owned drug manufacturer really exists yet. So to get insulin to patients soon, um, the original plan was by 2024, HCAI has contracted with a private insulin manufacturer called Civica RX. Um, Civica is a not-for-profit generic drug company. It was founded by hospitals and some philanthropies. It's recruited lots of seasoned experts from for-profit pharma, and it now has um, uh, dozens of FDA-approved products. Uh, and it's ambitiously targeted selling low-cost insulin on a nonprofit basis, not just in California, but around the United States. Um, the notion, <coughs> excuse me, um, the notion behind the HCI and Civica public-private partnership um, is that HCI provides Civica with valuable funding and a market for its insulin. Uh, which HCI will rebrand under its own state-owned Calorix label. And in return, HCI gets low-cost insulin in patients' hands as soon as possible. Um, it also gets seats on Civica's board. And crucially, it gets access to some of Civica's expertise um, so as to catalyze the state agency's efforts to eventually create fully public manufacturing. Um, seems like a reasonable and practical quid pro quo, perhaps. But with that public-private partnership has come some concerns over transparency and long-term vision. Um, for example, Civica has claimed trade secret like proprietary interests in some of the knowledge that it's contributing to the partnership and has shielded that information from disclosure to um, Californians, to T1 International, to the broader public. Uh, and Civica's incentives aren't exactly the same as California's or um, patients. Uh, for example, Civica would presumably prefer to have HCII rely on Civica for insulin manufacturing for many years to come, rather than see HCII transition to its own fully public manufacturing um, in the next few years. And while the current HCII Civica contract imposes price constraints on Civica, longer term Civica will probably want to raise its prices. So long story short, T1I has an interest in keeping the HCII Civica partnership transparent and accountable um, to patients. Um, and this was just reported, uh, I think, last week in the American Prospect, so I can talk about it more. Uh, my students and I have been working with T1I to try to create, um, uh, working with T1I and with HCAI, the state agency, to try to create a robust patient advisory council that will advise decisions made by HCAI and Civica, that will have some visibility into their decision making. Um, we want this patient advisory council as part of the sort of permanent structure of HCII and CalRx, a permanent voice for patients. 
Um, my students and I, for example, helped Tim and I draft a proposed charter for the advisory council, laying out its rights and responsibilities. Um, and we're still talking with CalRx, with HAI about this. Um, T1AI doesn't just want any patient voices shaping CalRx, it wants independent patient voices. Um, I already talked about this, that not all patient groups are independent. Um, so another kind of legal task that we've worked on is trying to create a workable definition of what an independent patient group is um, and encourage HCI and Civica to bake that into uh, the Patient Advisory Council. Um, for the record, T1AI doesn't insist on having one of its own members on the council, um, though I think it would happily place one or more. Uh, there are other terrific independent patient groups uh, representing um, people living with diabetes in California, like Health Access California, for example. Um, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, another big thing that we've done with T1 International is contract analysis. So even before the Patient Advisory Council has been created and populated, we've been offering informal advice to HCI officials responsible for um, CalRx and responsible for contracting with Civica. Um, and we've urged HCI to fight for rights to um, certain kinds of information, certain things um, that we think will position HCI to shift to fully public R&D and fully public manufacturing in the years to come. And that includes rights to things like regulatory data, uh, to intellectual property and more. Uh, the first major HCII Civica contract was announced and released just this past March. My students and I have done a detailed postmortem of the contract and one of my students, Nicole Kuntz, and I have a short article in the works analyzing what we think is good about the HCII and, and Civica contract, um, but also some thoughts on what we think could be improved. Um, and uh, we're thinking about this piece, not just as shaping CalRx, but also shaping public insulin initiatives and public pharma initiatives more broadly in other states as well. Um, let me digress just briefly and say that the HCAI Civica contract illuminates how slippery the term public pharma can be. Um, CalRx is undoubtedly a public pharma initiative. We have a state government agency owning a pharmaceutical trademark. It claims or intends when by all rights, uh, by all indications it will, uh, procure and distribute drugs on a nonprofit basis. Um, but it's not totally clear that CalRx or HCI as it stands now is really a public manufacturing initiative. Um, and public manufacturing, sort of as you drill down, you realize um, can mean a lot of different things. It can mean fully public manufacturing where government agencies own and operate the factories. It can mean government owned but contractor operated factories. It can perhaps even mean things like publicly traded, even for-profit companies where a government agency owns a controlling share of the stock. Um, and you have other things like public benefit, nonprofit corporations, and even like worker-owned co-ops with board seats for government officials. And there's maybe some kind of spectrum or, uh, or panoply of options within this, um, this category of public pharma. Um, so one of the things we've sort of learned, my students and I and T1I, um, is that you have to look under the hood of public pharma. You have to look sort of at the function and not just the form uh, to see who has control of the infrastructure, who has control of the knowledge of the key rights. Um, the other last digression here I'll just say is there's just, we've seen incredibly rich opportunities for lawyering here. Um, you know, contract interpretation, looking at state corporate law, um, thinking about charters and bylaws. Um, this is not my traditional specialty, um, but I've done my best to, to learn enough to keep up with my students and to give T1I and HCI the best advice I can. Um, okay, sorry, let me get back on track and say the last two things that I've worked on with, uh, with T1I uh, vis-a-vis -vis CalRx are distribution challenges and public education. So um, distribution challenges will be real. Um, uh, manufacturing insulin and getting FDA approval would be major achievements but not enough, um, necessary, but insufficient. Uh, we have to get that insulin to patients. And as Audrey Steenan described in her American Prospect piece last week, um, HCAI and CalRx may need to devise some new strategies to distribute CalRx insulin because the PBMs, the distributors, the middlemen, um, the pharmacies that currently get insulin from manufacturers to patients, uh, they take a hefty cut of the sort of the, the the current price of insulin. Um, they have incentives in the, to, to perpetuate the current system. They may not wanna play nice with a low cost um, alternative. I can't talk too much about this work because it's not yet public, but I will say 
we think the distribution challenges will be a major part of the work of the Patient Advisory Council. Um, I think Audrey reported on that. And we're looking at some creative solutions, um, including things like getting insulin to patients by mail, um, and also thinking about how we can work within uh, an existing California state pharmacy law um, to encourage pharmacies to stock CalRx. Um, last thing I'll say is that T1I and my students have started already doing some outreach and education work to build awareness, um, maybe even you might say build a market for Calorex insulin in California. Um, this is much more T1I's work, but my students and I have been proud to be part of it. Um, Kevin Wren, for example, who's, uh, who was until very recently the chapter leader in the state of California. Um, he was on the radio last year with Chris Noble from Health Access California um, to talk about um, Calorex insulin on the horizon and why patients should care. Um, Patient outreach and education, um, knowledge and resource sharing among people living with diabetes is a, is a core part of T1 International's work. And so it's a core part of my clinic's work too. Um, I'll just say briefly, like T1I, part of what it sees as its job is um, it's, you know, it's not just kind of winning these big policy victories. Uh, it's also building and sustaining mutual aid networks and knowledge networks. Um, and after every legislative victory that T1I has won, um, like, for example, getting emergency insulin laws passed in Minnesota and other states, T1I has done outreach uh, to patients to educate them, um, to inform them about these laws that provide um, you know, new rights, new access to insulin. Um, so that's part of what we're thinking uh, uh, we need to do when Calorex Insulin finally launches. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn briefly to the future of CalRx uh, and other public insulin efforts before I close. Um, the challenges are very real, um, even vis-a-vis -vis CalRx, which is the big banner initiative in the US so far. Um, and I've mentioned some challenges already, transparency, accountability, um, distribution challenges. Another one very practical challenge is that Civica has apparently fallen behind its ambitious development timetable. Um, so in November, Bloomberg <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Bloomberg reported that Civica is not yet ready to file for FDA approval, and that um, patients are now unlikely to see Calorex branded insulin before 2025. Um, at the same time, I think the Calorex insulin remains a vital uh, and even transformative intervention into the broken insulin market in the US. Um, I'll say uh, to kind of uh, anticipate some questions that I've gotten um, talking about this or parts of this work before. Uh, many of you may know that in early 2023, um, and again, actually last week, the big three insulin manufacturers, Santa Fe, Novo Nordisk, and Eli Lilly, announced massive price cuts to the list prices on some of their products, um, some as big as 80%. Um, and some products uh, uh, are now uh, officially at least priced at less than $30 per vial. P1 International um, and I2, uh, are wary, um, unsure that these price cuts are actually reaching patients, um, especially the patients who need them most. Um, last year, T1I and did a survey of pharmacies uh, and patients across the US and found that most people were unable to get the promised $25 or $30 vials of insulin. Um, and one major manufacturer, Novo Nordisk, withdrew an older product called Levimir from the market completely uh, in the US after promising to cut its price a few months prior. Um, so uh, T1 and I, and I continue to think that um, public pharma as imperfect and, and uh, 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 uncertain as it is still offers um, uh, uh, a promising alternative to um, this sort of track record of, of broken promises and exploitation from these big for-profit manufacturers. Um, to that end, um, T1I is trying to get more states to embrace public insulin manufacturing. Um, and my students, Jeannie Lay and Kyla Alston, Nicole Kuntz, and Zelly Rosa have written an extensive toolkit, um, what we call toolkit, to guide T1I and other patient activists as they advocate um, for public insulin, uh, not just manufacturing, but procurement uh, and PBMs in various states around the country. Um, we're continually updating this document with research. Um, uh, Jeannie and Kyla wrote an op-ed with T1 International staff member, Allison Hart, last year. I'm encouraging more states to look at the CalRx model. Um, and I think it's fair to say, even despite the challenges CalRx has encountered, uh, momentum is building. For example, the state of Maine has established a commission to explore the possibility of public insulin manufacturing there. Um, Allison Hart of T1 International is one of about a dozen experts on the commission. Uh, also, Connecticut just joined the Array RX public PBM, um, so that public PBM is growing. Um, hopefully, insulin will be cheaper for patients living in California. 
Um, all right, I think I'm gonna to try to wrap it up and reflect and close as I've, I've already talked longer than I intended. Um, I just wanna offer a handful of quick reflections on why I find this public pharma work exciting, um, inspiring even. Um, one is that there's so many places to start. As I, I tried kind of roughly to taxonomize before, public pharma can mean public R&D manufacturing, but it can also mean public distribution, public PBMs, uh, figuring out how to get meds to people by mail. Um, there are opportunities, I think, to rethink every link in the chain from sourcing starting materials to getting medicines actually to patients. So there's just lots of opportunities to do work here. Um, and it, kind of on that point, there are not nearly enough practicing lawyers, at least in the US, working on this. Um, I think we need more help. Um, T1 International has questions that we haven't been able to answer. And I know um, from conversations I've had, there are other patient and consumer groups, um, you know, kind of representing people living with other kinds of diseases and conditions looking for legal help. Um, everyone from cancer patients, um, there's been you know, dozens of cancer drugs in shortage in the US um, in the past couple of years. Uh, people living with ADHD, um, ADHD drugs have been in shortage. Um, so folks are looking for help to kind of get new public pharma initiatives off the ground. I'm glad to put lawyers with time and interest in touch with some of those organizations um, if, if you're listening. Um, a third reason I find this work exciting is it, for me, um, it sort of reminds me of my, my limits, the limits of law, the limits of lawyers. Um, a lot of what we do on public pharma is quote unquote non-legal. We're doing factual research, we're doing policy work, we're doing um, advocacy, um, or we're simply like sharing knowledge, building knowledge with our client, with its members um, and with allies. Um, there's lots of traditional legal work too, doing legal research and writing memos and um, you know, even doing things like drafting charters or public records requests. Um, but uh, yeah, the boundary is blurry. And I like this project in part because it's forced me to embrace a more rebellious or movement lawyering approach. Um, and T1 International's volunteers, the, the, the people living with diabetes um, themselves are really the stars and, and drivers of this story, um, not us lawyers. Um, two more quick reasons why I care about this work. One is just um, working at the state level in the US often feels to me more hopeful, um, more fertile or less defensive and depressing than work at the federal level, um, whether that's the federal courts or US Congress. Um, I suspect everyone listening knows about the uh, US federal courts and Congress, so I won't say more than that, but um, there are good things happening in, uh, in the states. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I see, and I feel um, this public pharma work uh, in real solidarity with other um, legal and, and activist and political movements fighting for greater public control of other parts of our economy and society in the US, um, in housing, in energy and transportation, uh, in information technology and telecommunications and much more. Um, the fight for public pharma is in some sense a fight against you know, powerful corporate interests for an industrial policy that better serves people. Um, it's a fight over who controls the agenda for innovation, a fight over who enjoys the benefits of new technologies and who suffers um, the harms of new technologies. Um, and in some sense, public pharma, because it's happening in the US, offers a key test. It, it like CalRx, for example, um, uh, poses the question, can we build at the state level in the US viable alternatives to increasingly predatory uh, and unsustainable um, corporate structures um, searching for ever higher returns. Um, I think so, I hope so. Um, and I hope that what works in public pharma um, or what doesn't work in public pharma informs our efforts to, you know, to remake energy, um, to tackle the climate crisis and to do so much else um, in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, and I wrote a little bit uh, along those lines in a recent piece in Boston Review with Rachel Ramachandran and Amy Kapchinsky, which is on screen. Okay, uh, so sorry to go long. Um, let me just very quickly acknowledge and thank uh, the people who really did this work. Um, so uh, four of the student attorneys who've um, done a disproportionate share of it are Kyla Alston, Jeannie Lay, Zelly Rosa, and Nicole Kuntz. All of them were in my clinic at various points, um, all amazing and talented. I can't wait to see what they do in the world as lawyers. Um, also want to credit um, T1 International's um, staff and their member volunteers. I'm covering Chewy, but um, for folks who've been involved in public pharma work are Shana Casper, Policy and Advocacy Director, Allison Hart, um, Community Development Manager, Kevin Wren, um, who's a member and volunteer, but also California State Chapter Leader, uh, and Chewy Lamb, um, also an advocate member who lives in California. 
Um, there are many, many more um, who I need to thank, uh, folks researching and advocating public pharma whom I've learned from, um, including Matt Herter and Janice Graham at Dow, um, Dana Brown at Democracy Collaborative, um, Chris Noble, uh, an insulin advocate in California. Um, I'll say very briefly, uh, Dana Brown and I gave a talk, a very um, informal talk um, on public pharma in September uh, to universities allied for essential medicines and we compiled a list of further reading. Um, it's on screen here. I'm glad to circulate it to folks after the talk or even drop it into the Zoom chat if that's helpful. Um, Dana is really the expert on public farm in the US, so I encourage you to check out her stuff. Um, okay, that's it. Let me um, stop talking and I'm eager to hear um, your reactions and questions. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. If we were fortunate enough to be in person, you hear lots of applause, I'm sure. Um, before I open it up to questions, uh, I misdirected folks earlier. I think I said put questions in the chat. Um, use the Q&A function. We've got one there uh, now, but that's the best place to put your questions and I'll articulate them for you. Uh, we have a bit of time. We have until about 25 after the hour uh, for discussion. So the first question, Hey, Matt, I'm so sorry. I, I heard you say the first question, but then I, I haven't heard you say anything since then. I think I tapped on mute by accident, but it was just that little fragment that you missed, right? Um, no, I didn't, just uh, if you could start the question over, I'd appreciate, sorry. Yeah, sure, I haven't got it. Um, so our first question is from uh, Colleen Fuller. Um, thanks you for the very interesting presentation. Um, T1 International have done a terrific job on a number of fronts, including public education. I've been working to support an increased range of options in the insulin market, including animal sourced insulin. Connaught lab inventories show it had produced six standard types of insulin in both beef and pork in two concentrations. Plus um, half of these were for insulin for a small number of people. Is T1 looking at this type of diversity? Yeah. Um, short answer is yes. And uh, the, the advocates of T1I will know more about this than I do. Um, I think long-term T1I has embraced or endorsed um, public pharma for like all of the um, forms of insulin and other medicines, like especially um, uh, insulin is not the only medicine that people living with diabetes rely on. Um, for now, I think the Calorex initiative has decided to target just three forms of insulin. Um, and so we're sort of hoping that those, that Calorex succeeds in getting those three to patients. Um, but then I think part of a longer term strategy is getting Calorex to go fully public and getting Calorex um, sort of portfolio of insulin products to expand. Does that answer the question? I think so. And, and Colleen, we welcome a follow up if you want to add one into the the Q&A box and please others feel free to do so. In the meantime, Chris, I was really um, uh, you know, excited to hear the connection with this, I, this broader movement to sort of um, take back control and have a stronger public presence in all sorts of sectors. Um, but I, so I wanted to kind of ask a question about social movements and political strategy, um, mm -hmm. because I think you know, part of the value of this work in pharma in particular um, in terms of building up a movement is naming all of these things that are in fact already public pharma, right? And that's how you point to like how it's all these things and more. Um, and I think that's powerful to showcase the value that the public sector already does and perhaps identify areas where it's not there enough. Yeah. But I guess I wanted to invite you to reflect on whether there are downsides to not being more specific about that vision. Um, and I'm getting at that because of like the example you gave of how, you know, without T1's involvement, the focus on a more diverse set of insulin products may not have been possible without it, that input. So having maybe public pharma has to mean public participation in very concrete ways. But I'm also thinking about some of the other things you listed, like fill and finish, uh, you know, some manufacturers of vaccines uh, in speaking with other manufacturers and state controlled enterprises in Brazil, they will say, we will never do fill and finish because it leaves us vulnerable to supply chain problems. And so we can't address local needs. So for them, part of public pharma 
that's our words, not their language, is having full control over the whole process. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm wondering, I'm inviting you to think out loud about whether we need to be more specific about what we mean or if we're nearing that political moment. Um, yes. Uh, so I think if I, so I think you've asked a really um, important and kind of like central question, um, at least if I understand you correctly. And I think I'll start by saying there's both like value and hazard in looking to historical examples and looking at the kind of patchwork of public pharma efforts that exist in the US. And you know, there's, there's value in those examples because number one, they show that it can be done, that it's not totally implausible for public agencies to replace private companies doing many of these things. Um, and to the extent that they've made mistakes, um, we can learn from those lessons. Uh, but part of the hazard of looking at um, what already exists or has ex existed is that it, it can kind of narrow your um, your vision and make you think that like the only things that are possible are what we've tried before. Um, and I think they're in the world of public pharma. I think Dana Brown will be one of the first people to talk about this. And she indeed has already started writing about this. And I think others thinking about kind of public governance of important kinds of infrastructure, um, all are grappling now with questions about um, how to create um, institutions, whether those are public agencies or public benefit corporations or other, whatever the precise formulation is, institutions that are democratically accountable, that serve patients, that also kind of respond to a broader democratic public, and yet are not so, I don't know, like you want some level, if it's a drug manufacturer, you want some level of independence, right? You don't want, I think, like the research agenda getting reset every election or something. So right. I, long, long story short, I think um, one of the deep theoretical questions in the area of public pharma is like, what are the ideal arrangements within these institutions? If we have in the US at least, right, we have like, you know, volumes and volumes and volumes written on corporate law and how to orient organizations or in, orient firms around, um, you know, shareholder return, um, maximizing returns for shareholders. And we have boards of directors and executives and securities litigation and all of this law that exists to structure those organizations in ways that serve shareholders. Um, if shareholder profit, shareholder returns is not the ultimate you know, goal of a public pharma agency, we presumably need very different rules and different incentives, but I don't know that we know exactly what those are yet. Um, and I think people are starting to write about this in different ways, in different places, and Dana's among them. Um, I have a colleague at Columbia Law School named Katerina Pistor, who's teaching a class this semester that I'm gonna to try to sit in on called the Law of Non-Capitalist Enterprises that looks mm -hmm. at worker-owned co-ops and looks at other kinds of um, uh, uh, sort of nonprofit seeking or institutions for which profit is not the only or main goal. Um, and basically I hope to learn more. I've just given you a rambling answer uh, with no punch, but that's, uh, this that's, is where we need people writing and thinking about this desperately, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the Calor yeah, Exodus- a lot of conversation about how do we change the status quo and we, people don't define what actually the essential features of the status quo are and what an alternative likes conversely, but- right. the, Q and A is starting to fill up, so I'm going to make sure to pivot to some of the other questions. But that that was very helpful. Um, so another participant asked that they understand private pharma companies are engaged in lots of political lobbying in different ways. Um, but do private companies ever provide the government directly with funds to conduct public pharma activities? And how much of a barrier do you think big pharma's political agenda plays in a shift to a more public pharma? Hmm. Good questions. Um, well, I certainly think big pharma's political agenda plays um, an enormous role in the shift or in the in resisting the shift to public pharma. Um, and I think that some of the news coverage, for example, like when California enacted its law in 2020, there was very critical news coverage. I mean, with lots of kernels of truth, but critical news coverage that said. Um, you know, uh, public agencies, like command and control economies have failed. Governments are bad at innovation. Um, but also there are all these like practical considerations that governments won't, state agencies won't be able to crack. Like you have refrigeration, you have supply chains, you have like this very complex interplay of many, many, many actors. Um, and how are a few government bureaucrats sitting in Sacramento gonna figure all of this out? Um, uh, 
yeah, so so I don't know. All of those narratives are being um, echoed by big pharma, um, and certainly like Calorex has been um, Calorex has been kind of uh, uh, both vilified and dismissed by the big three. Right? Sometimes the big three will say like, "Well, we don't really think Calorex is going to get there." Um, we're not really worried because it's not going to succeed. Um, but then they'll also say, uh, if it does get there, it's going to hurt patients because they're not going to be making the right kinds of stuff in the right kind of way. We can't trust these agencies to do that. Right. Um, so I'm not sure. Anyway, so I, I do think the kind of like the, 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 the power of, of uh, for-profit pharma and the political economy is incredibly important. Um, at the same time, uh, these for-profit companies that resist, I think, the kind of principle of public pharma or uh, resist certain implementations of it benefit from it in a million different ways. Um, I don't know of many examples of private companies funding public pharma activities per se, um, but certainly they partner with public agencies and especially at like an early stage research, for example, right? Like it's almost the paradigm in the US where early stage research is done in a government lab or a government funded academic lab. Uh, and then the technology gets transferred to, um, to a private company. Yeah. Um, just moving on, just to make sure we get through a few more questions because they're, they're really helpful. Um, Harrison asks, seeing the drugs are priced very differently country to country, what pressure can you put on big pharma companies to lower prices in their countries uh, that do not have a robust patient advocacy system? Yeah. And there is no T1 international. Yeah. So one thing is, um, you know, hopefully uh, we will have more robust patient advocacy in more countries around the world. And T1I does a lot in India, for example, um, where like insulin rationing is a huge problem. Um, but there's no easy, I mean, to some extent, this, this is a, this is such an important question, but to some extent, this is a question inextricable from like questions of like imperialism and, and extraction and, 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 and power, global power. Um, so I don't have like a specific public pharma solution to this, except that my hope is that a public pharma manufacturer um, like CalRx could make and sell its products at low cost all over the world, not just in the place where they're made. And that goes back to incentives, right? Like CalRx, um, I hope that Calorex's goals are not to maximize revenue. And thus, if Calorex sells to other states or other countries, it's not charging Eli Lilly-like prices. I hope instead that you have, you know, honestly, what we've seen, for example, with um, like Cuban um, vaccines, where you have uh, manufacturers selling products at low cost all over the world. Yeah. Very true. Um, Sheila Wildman asks uh, a few questions. I'll just, for the sake of time, uh, try to drill down on one and or two. Um, first, can you comment on challenges of course, strategies around access to mifepristone in particular? Um, and then also this, this thought around whether focusing on public pharma might skew things away from other clear you know, uh, drivers of health outcomes, the social determinants of health and alternatives to pharmaco uh, pharmacological interventions. So is there space for those, that sort of wider set of questions and possible interventions in the context of public pharma, as Sheila, I hope I'm doing justice to your question. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, I'm going to take the second one first, just to say, um, yeah, I at least think of public pharma work as kind of a subset of public medicine work in the U.S. And then you have, and uh, I say that because I think a lot of the folks who embrace public pharma are among the folks who are skeptical of the like sort of silver bullet, like the pharmaceutical solution to um, health problems um, and would really like to see universal health care, <laughs> universal health insurance in the United States, whether that's Medicare for all or be another system and the development of more um, public health infrastructure in the U.S. Um, I think of this work as complementary and not contradictory. I mean, part of the problem in the US, part of the story of disinvestment in public health in the US has been that we pay so much for drugs and we have this kind of like, you know, we allocate X billions of dollars every year and we have the story of innovation, the story of like silver bullet solutions. Um, I think about things, for example, like um, state prison systems in the United States spending so much money on sofosbuvir, the hepatitis C cure, um, that they couldn't afford other kinds of health care. So anyway, I hope the work is complementary and not um, um, doesn't displace uh, um, other work. And gosh, mifepristone, I haven't, I don't know of any public pharma effort on mifepristone. Um, mifepristone in my mind would be a good candidate because it's a generic drug. It's relatively simple to make. Um, uh, 
Uh, you know, so much of the kind of the turmoil in the U.S. over methapristone has not been about price, but just about whether the drug's approval will survive. That's being challenged right now. Um, and whether states like West Virginia will be allowed to create their own effective bans on the drug. Um, if that's the case, I'm not sure that having a public source versus a private source makes, makes a huge difference, but it's something I want to think about more. And that's separate work that actually my students and I have done with a different client, Doctors for America, um, on access to methapristone. Um, just do one more because we only have time, but it's, it's great to see that this talk has provoked such a good discussion. Um, so Amanda Porter writes, this talk was excellent. Uh, thank you. While I see some of the benefits of distributing ma by mail medications to patients directly, I did find myself wondering about potential risks of skipping the pharmacist's usual role in providing patient education, assessing appropriateness, and so on. Uh, it seems like empowering pharmacists to work side outside of for-profit pharmacies might be an area to explore so that we can both obtain financial benefits for patients while also reducing risks that might arise from cutting the pharmacist um, as opposed to the pharmacy out of the picture. Mm, terrific point. Um, I think there are real trade-offs there. I think the sort of meds by mail, I mean, there are advantages um, I know for methapristone, for example, there have been major improvements in access um, to the drug achieved through uh, the legalization of methapristone by mail in the US. But there are also harms that attach to like removing a professional uh, and, a, and an opportunity for advice to, to patients. Um, I think right now it's, uh, I think that, myth, that, that um, insulin by mail is maybe not the optimal solution, but might be a workable solution um, for CalRx and perhaps for other public insulin initiatives, but this goes to a broader point that like, to some extent, what we're trying to do is figure out how to get public pharma initiatives started against the backdrop of these private actors that are really unwelcoming to those initiatives. But over time, you know, perhaps we could imagine, I don't, I don't actually know if there's any history of public pharmacy infrastructure in the US, but I'm sure there is actually with the VA and that, that I'm, I'm absolutely certain there is. Um, yeah, so, you know, perhaps there's a longer term solution where we can have kind of both. Um, we can have public pharma, but also have pharmacists advising patients through these um, choices that they make. Yeah, it's a really important point to think about it. Um, well, thank you. I, I will thank you again in a moment. I just, uh, we'll have to close the discussion there um, in keeping with our practice. But before I do, um, thank you once again. I wanted to mention for folks who've joined us online that our next seminar um, is going to be actually in person. Uh, so if you're in the area, hopefully you can make time to take part. Um, it is on February 9th. I had the, the uh, schedule in front of me. Uh, yes, and the, the next presentation is by Alexa Yakubovich. Um, and the title of her presentation is How is the Health System Responding to Violence Against Women in Nova Scotia? So she's a member of Dalhousie's Community Health and Epidemiology Department within the Faculty of Medicine, and that is on Friday, February 9th, so roughly a month's time. Hopefully folks will be able to get together uh, on that date. Um, with that said, uh, I just wanted to thank you again, Chris, not just for a provocative talk, but also kind of a courageous performance with the symptoms you're enduring right now. Uh, you don't look like death, <laughs> uh, but we really uh, feel your pain, I think. Uh, it's, you know, it's such a rich topic and um, I really appreciate you persevering through the presentation. I'm, I'm so grateful to, uh, for you all to, to uh, have invited me and I appreciate your patience, forbearance as you, I sort of felt like performance art at points as I like, uh, uh, you know, sweat and coughed my way through various parts of the talk, but thank you. Of course, and it, it is also just powerful to see uh, working closely um, in a kind of traditional lawyering way, but in a way that's truly supportive of interest that perhaps traditional lawyers don't um, uh, welcome uh, and working with the students in your midst to, to create these opportunities for advocacy and effective change um, inside, you know, these powerful spaces um, where perhaps a lot of people don't have access. So it's just such important work and uh, really appreciate you bringing it to us on this day, uh, even from a distance. Um, so on that note, thank you again, Chris. Um, thank you everyone online for joining us. Uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And can I say one more thing, which is email me. I'm going to put my email. Sorry, I'm now um, uh, blasting the poor Zoom chat, but I've I've dropped a link to uh, the list of further reading that Dana and I compiled a few months ago, and I've just put my email address in there too. So glad to hear further questions and reactions. I have to 
I think cut and paste that to make sure everyone oh, sorry. can get it. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I don't but mean to I'm gonna, extra work. No, no, it's, it's totally okay. But I will just suggest if folks look up the Health Justice Institute at Dow and want to email me, I can relay that information um, just as people start to drop off the call. So I wanted to mention that. Right. But thank you once again. Thanks uh, so much, Matt. Thank you all. Take, Take care, care, everyone.